Hi, I'm Ben from Internachi. We're in the How to Inspect the Attic Insulation, Ventilation, and Interior course provided by Internachi to members, and it's free and online to members. And we're going to learn a little bit about doors, egress, stairs, steps, handrails, and illumination. And right now we're in the doors, egress, and landings section of that course. And let's learn a little bit about egress doors and measuring the door. So there has to be one main door, a required door, the egress door for every house. And that provides access to the home without um, going through any kind of garage or garage door. Now you can measure the door. The required door, the egress door, must be a side hinged door. It has to have hinges on the side. It has to provide a clear space of at least 32 inches wide, measured from the door surface to the door stop when the door is open at 90 degrees, a 90 degree angle. So you open the egress door and it's not 36 inches, right? It's from the surface of the opened door at 90 degrees to the door stop. It has to be at least what? 32 inches. The door should be at least 78 inches high or six feet, eight inches in height. Other doors do not need to meet these minimum dimensions. They can be of any size and need not be a swinging type. All egress doors shall be readily openable from the inside without the use of a tool or a key or special knowledge and effort. So an interior keyed deadbolt makes an emergency exit difficult, impossible, and that's a hazard. And I, as a home inspector, I call out that as a defect. And this standard permits a wide variety of hardware options instead of using some kind of tool to get out. Now, measure the landing's width. The width of a landing should not be less than the door's width. It's got to be at least as wide as the door. That makes sense. The minimum dimension of every landing is 36 inches measured in the direction of travel. So when you are standing at the egress door, let's say, or you're walking out the egress door, um, a landing should be there, and it should be at least 36 inches in the direction of travel. If it's less than that, that's a trip hazard. And it should be at least as wide as the door itself. Now, check the floors or landings at the doors. So on each side of the exterior door, there should be a floor or a landing. The floor or landing should not be more than one and a half inches below the top of the threshold. And there are exceptions. Here's, here's one of them. If the door does not swing over the landing, then the exterior landing can be at most seven and three quarter inches below the top of the threshold. So if the door does not swing over the landing, then the exterior landing can be at most a step down at most seven and three quarters inches below the top of the threshold. And this is applicable to all exterior doors, including the required egress door. And screen and storm doors are allowed to swing over the landing, and this is the most commonly used exception. If a stairway with at most two risers is at the exterior side of a door, if the stairway with at most two risers is at the exterior side of the door, other than the required egress door, a landing on the outside is not required, provided the door does not swing over the stairway. So it's a really important. The, the general rule is you really shouldn't have main egress doors, main doors, exterior doors swinging over stairways. There should be a nice landing there. And at most, a step down, seven and three quarter inches. Again, the screen and storm door is allowed to swing over the stairway. Another exception, a floor at all exterior doors other than the required egress door should not be more than seven and three quarter inches lower than the top of the threshold. Yep. It's also acceptable to raise the threshold of an exterior door other than the egress door up to seven and three quarter inches above the floor on the interior side. The exception to the rule for a landing at an exterior door is illustrated within the course. If the door does not swing over the landing, then the exterior landing can be at most seven and three quarter inches below the top of the threshold. This is applicable to all exterior doors, including the required egress door. Another exception to the rule for landing at an exterior door is illustrated in a graphic within the course. If a stairway with at most two risers is at the exterior side of a door, other than the required egress door, 
A landing on the outside is not required, provided the door does not swing over the stairway. Again, the screen and storm door is allowed to swing over the stairway. Hallways. Once you walk in through the egress door or the exterior door and you may get to a hallway, well, the minimum width of the hallway is what? 36 inches. Ramps. There are three main points to check while inspecting a ramp. They are the ramp's slope, the ramp's landings, and the ramp's handrails. Check the ramp's slope. Ramps should not have a slope greater than one unit vertical and 12 units horizontal. One and 12. Eight and a half, um, 8.3% slope. It shouldn't be greater than that. It's a very low slope, one to 12. That's the maximum. There is an exception. In areas where it's not possible to comply with the 1 in 12 slope, ramps may have a maximum slope of 1 in 8 or a 12.3 slope. Check the landing. A minimum 3 by 3 foot landing should be installed in the following four locations, at the top of the ramp and at the bottom of the ramp, and where doors open onto the ramp and where the ramp changes direction. Check the handrails. There should be a handrail on at least one side of all ramps that have a slope greater than the 112 slope maximum. Typically, installers install a handrail on all ramps regardless of the slope. Check the handrail's height. What's the minimum height of a ramp's handrail measured from the finished surface of the ramp? The minimum, 34 inches. The maximum, 38 inches. So minimum 34, maximum 38. Check for continuity. Handrails should be continuous for the full length of the ramp, even around the turn. Check the termination. Handrails should end at a newel post, wall, or safety terminal. Measure the space. The space between a handrail at a ramp and the wall should be at least one and a half inches, 38 millimeters. Measure the length. The maximum rise for any run shall be 30 inches. If the slope of a ramp is between 1 and 12 and 116, 112, 116, the maximum rise shall be 30 inches. That's as high as it's going to go. And the maximum horizontal run is 30 feet. So 30 inches high, 30 feet long. If the slope of the ramp is between 116 and 120, the maximum rise shall be 30 inches and the maximum horizontal run shall be 40. So we learned a little bit about egress, doors, and ramps. Now let's go to stairways. And this, and we're going to um, reference the 2018 International Residential Code, IRC. Uh, it's section 311, R311. Stairways. Stairways are one of the most hazardous areas of a home, and stair falls are often fatal. So let's go over the standards and requirements of a stairway and ramp in detail so that when you're on a home inspection, you may be able to recognize defects, observe them, observe, observe the stairways and handrails, and report them if they are defective. So, stairway handrails. Determine whether the stairway should have a handrail. For the United States and Canada, any stairway with four or more risers should have a handrail on at least one side. That's what the code says. But thank goodness I'm a home inspector. <laughs> As a home inspector, I'm not a code inspector. I don't even need to refer to code. I often, as a home inspector, will call out one step that doesn't have a handrail. If I know my client is very old, or there's a child, or somebody just needs some extra help getting up a step, one step. So often, as a home inspector, I'll, I will call out one riser, two risers, or three risers that do not have a handrail as defective. That's really your call. But it's good to understand what code says. Maybe you want to exceed that standard in favor of your client's needs. Let's measure the handrail's height. 
The height of a handrail is measured vertically from the sloped plane adjoining the tread nosing or leading edge. In the United States, the handrail height should be at least how many inches? It's the same for ramps, 34. And the maximum, 38. Um, if there's a continuous handrail transi transition between flights, the handrail height at the transition might be greater than the maximum. Continuity. The handrail should be continuous for the full length of the flight of stairs measured from a point directly above the top riser to a point directly above the bottom riser of the flight. Continuity can be interrupted by a newel post at a turn. In the United States, a volute, a starting easing or a turnout can be installed over the lowest tread. It's that fancy thing at the bottom of the tread. Check the handrail's termination. Handrails should end at a newel post or wall. For Canada, handrails shall terminate in a manner that will not obstruct travel or create a hazard. That's a good standard. Check the handrail clearance. For the United States, handrails adjacent to a wall should have a space of not less than one and a half inches, at least one and a half inches between the wall and the handrail. Check the handrail attachment to the wall. I grab, as a home inspector, I grab that handrail and I give it a good tug in any direction. It should be able to hold a 200 pound load in any point on that handrail in any direction. How about the width of the stairway? When a handrail is installed on only one side, the minimum clear width of the stairway at and below the handrail height is at least 31 and a half inches. When handrails are installed on both sides, the minimum clear width of the stairway at and below the handrail height is at least 27 inches. Measure the width of the stairway. Stairways should be at least 36 inches wide. This is measured at all points above the handrail height and below the required headroom height. For spiral stairways, there should be a width of at least 26 inches measured at and below the handrail. Handrail projections. Handrails should not project more than four and a half inches on either side of the stairway. And measure projections other than the handrail. So typically when a building standard requires a minimum width, it is expected that the width be the clear, net, usable, unobstructed width. However, the standard described here is not concerned with components such as trim, stringers, or other items that may be found below the handrail as long as they do not exceed the projection of the handrail. The stairway width limitations are based upon the body's movements as a person walks on a stairway. Projections of four and a half inches or less located below the handrail, including tread, trims, stringers, or other items are permitted. Risers and treads. The riser height. The minimum riser height is four inches. If it's less than four inches, that's a hazard. And the maximum riser height is seven and three quarter inches. For spiral stairs, the maximum rise is nine and a half inches. So measure the difference between the riser heights. Any significant variation that would interfere with the rhythm of a person's natural stride on a stairway should be avoided. The greatest riser height within any flight of stairs should not exceed the smallest by more than three quarters of an inch. The tread depth. The minimum tread depth is 10 inches. For winders, this is measured at the 12 inch walk line. What's the difference between the, the treads depths? Well, the greatest tread depth within any flight of stairs should not exceed the smallest by more than three eighths of an inch. The tolerance for differences allowed for risers and treads is because construction practices make it difficult to create identical riser heights and tread dimensions in the field. Spiral staircases. For spiral stairs, all treads should be identical. Each tread should have a depth of at least seven and a half inches at the 12 inches mark from the narrow edge of, this, of the stairway. For winder stairs, the treads should have a depth of at least 10 inches measured at a point 12 inches from the side where the treads are the narrowest. Winder treads should have a depth of at least six inches at any point. Slope, slope of a stairway tread. The walking surface of the stairway treads 
and landings should be sloped no steeper than one unit vertical and 48 units horizontal. That's hardly sloped at all. It's a one quarter inch to a 12 inch ratio, one quarter to 12 or 2% slope. The minimum concentrated load on a stair tread on an area of four inches, four square inches is 300 pounds. So you should be able to get 300 pounds in a four square inch area on a tread. And that's the minimum concentrated load. It should at least hold 300 pounds. And you should always check for cracked, damaged, and loose treads. Now the nosing and leading edge. On stairways with solid risers, there should be a nosing of at least three quarters of an inch and not more than one and one quarter inches. The radius of a nosing curve should be no greater than nine sixteenths of an inch and a nosing is not required when the tread depth is 11 inches or more. Guards. They're really guards. I sometimes call them railings. Guards should be constructed so as to prevent adults from falling over them and children from falling or crawling through them. The height of a guard is measured vertically from the sloped plane adjoining the tread nosing or leading edge. Check the guard strength. The design strength of a guard should resist a 200 pound concentrated load applied at any point in any direction along the handrail or the top of the guard. Check the strength of the rails or balusters. Intermediate rails and balusters should be able to withstand a horizontal load of 50 pounds on an area equal to one square foot. Measure the height of the elevated floor level. All decks and porches, including those with insect screenings, landings, balconies, mezzanines, galleries, ramps, and raised floor surfaces, located more than 30 inches in the United States, or 1.2 meters in Canada, above the floor or ground level should have guards. So if you have something that people can stand on, even if it's enclosed with some screening, and the floor surface is more than 30 inches above, up, that floor surface that you're standing on is more than 30 inches above the floor or the ground level, well, a guard is necessary. A guard is necessary at those elevated floor areas because a fall from that height can cause injury. What's the guard height? Well, the minimum height of the horizontal guard is 36 inches. Open sides of stairways with a total rise of more than 30 inches above the floor or ground should have guards not less than 34 inches in height. And always check for damage. Check for cracked, loose, or missing intermediate rails. And check for a ladder effect. Guards should not have horizontal or ornamental patterns, members, attachments, or openings that would facilitate climbing. Some guards may have glass. Glass used as a handrail assembly or a guard section should be constructed of single, fully tempered glass, laminated fully tempered glass, or laminated heat strengthened glass. The minimal nominal thickness is one quarter inch. Each pane of safety glazing installed shall be identified by a manufacturer's designation, which should be acid etched, sandblasted, ceramic fired, laser etched, embossed, or of a type that once applied can't be removed without being destroyed. Let's talk about spheres. Horizontal guards at raised floor areas, balconies, and porches should have intermediate rails or ornamental enclosures that do not allow the passage of a four inch diameter sphere. That's at the horizontal guard at a raised floor area. Open risers shall not allow the passage of a four inch sphere in diameter. On stairs with a total rise of 30 inches or less, the size of the open riser is not limited. A triangular area formed by a tread, a riser, and a guard. The triangular area formed by the tread, the riser, and the guard should not allow the passage of a sphere six inches in diameter. The opening at guards on the sides of stair treads should not allow the passage of a sphere four and three eighths inches in diameter. Hand grips. 
a hand grip should be graspable along the entire length of the handrail. The hand grip's shape should provide a graspable surface. It should allow the user to maintain a consistently secure and natural grasp on the handrail without twisting the fingers or requiring a release. The hand grip can be circular or shaped and non-circular. A circular hand grip should have a cross section minimum of one and one quarter inches and a maximum of two inches. All handrails should be equivalently graspable to the two inch circular hand grip. A non-circular hand grip with a perimeter a minimum of four inches and a maximum of six and a quarter inches should have a maximum cross section of two and a quarter inches. That's some technical stuff there. <laughs> but as a home inspector, one way to just determine if there's a defect is grasp the handrail. It shouldn't move, should hold on to that, right? And um, move it in all directions at any point. And it should be continuous all the way through. Now, above and below the stairs. Measure the headroom above the stairs. Headroom is measured vertically from the sloped plane adjoining the tread nosing or from the floor surface of the landing or platform. The headroom in all parts of a stairway should not be less than six feet, eight inches. Spiral staircase, spiral staircases, that's uh, six feet, six inches. Now below the stairs, an enclosed accessible space under the stairs should be protected on the enclosed side with half inch gypsum board drywall. You want to check for water damage at the bottom of the stair stringer boards, especially if they're wooden, and inspect, inspect below the stairs for mold, moisture intrusion, and damage caused by insect infestation. And check for ground contact, wooden stair components in contact with the ground or in contact with concrete exposed to weather shall be of an improved pressure preservative treated wood suitable for ground contact use. Landings, illumination, and attachment. Inspect the landings. A floor or landing is required at both the top and bottom of a stairway. There is an exception. A floor or landing is not required at the top of an interior flight of stairs, including stairs in an enclosed garage, provided that a door does not swing out over the stairs. Inspect the total rise of the stairway. It's 12 feet. A stairway should not have a vertical rise greater than 12 feet between floor levels or landings. Inspect the width of the landing, 36 inches, measured in the direction of travel. Every landing should be at least 36 inches measured in the direction of travel. The width of the landing should not be less than the width of the stairway. Illumination. There should be lighting at the stairs. All interior and exterior stairways should have a means to illuminate the stairs, including landings and treads. Interior stairways should have a light located at each landing, except when a light is installed directly over each stairway section. Lights in an exterior stairway should be controlled from inside the property. Interior stairways with at least six risers require wall switches at each floor level, unless the lights are continuously illuminated or automatically controlled. Exterior stairways should have a light located at the top of the stairway. Check the attachment to the structure. Required egress stairways, decks, balconies, and similar means of egress should be anchored to the primary structure to resist both vertical and lateral forces. The use of toenails or nails subject to withdrawal are not permitted. And that is a little bit about inspecting egress, stairs, landings, handrails, and illumination.